Good afternoon and welcome to Denver Seminaries in Perspective, where we are joined by authors, pastors, scholars, and alumni to host conversations on a wide range of topics and theological viewpoints. My name is Ryan Doherty and I serve as the Donor Relations Associate on the Advancement Team here at Denver Seminary. Before we begin today, I do want you to be aware that our next panel will take place on the evening of April 7th. You can join us in person at Denver Seminary or online. We will be discussing sexual abuse in the church with Kimberly Norris, who is attorney and co-founder of Ministry Safe, and Dr. Heather Gingrich, professor of counseling at Denver Seminary. Today's discussion, deconstruction. Today, our panelists will address the, address the assumptions, pitfalls, and opportunities existing within the concept of deconstruction. What is the impact of deconstruction, and should the church be concerned? How do Jesus' words and actions shed light on what it means to confront the social concerns of religion? How can followers of Jesus come alongside those who seek to address the incongruities of their faith traditions with their lived experiences? A few notes on the format of today's discussion. We will not be using the raise hand feature or the chat feature, but instead you can submit questions using the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. You can also use the upvote feature to mark if you have the same question or are interested in hearing a particular question answered. Unfortunately, we won't be able to address all questions, but we will do our best to choose the ones that are most relevant to our conversation today. And we do want to keep the Q&A queue clear, so we'll move any items that are not questions off of the list. At this time, I would like to introduce you to our moderator for today, Dr. Angie Ward. Dr. Angie Ward has over 30 years of leadership and teaching experience in church, parachurch, and Christian higher education ministry. She is the author of I Am a Leader, When Women Discover the Joy of Their Calling, and general editor of the Kingdom Conversation series with NAV Press, which fe features the recently released book, When the Universe Cracks, Living as God's People in Times of Crisis. The next book, Kingdom Country, Following Jesus in the Land that You Love, will be releasing this summer. Angie is a sought-after teacher and speaker, an award-winning contributor to Christianity Today, a 1996 graduate of Denver Seminary. Angie earned her PhD in ministry leadership from the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary. Angie also serves currently as the assistant director of the Doctor of Ministry program here at Denver Seminary. Thank you, Angie. And at this time, if our panelists would turn on their cameras and microphones, we will begin today's conversation on deconstruction. Great, here we come in. It's great, good to see everybody. Uh, well, welcome to those of you who are tuning in. Um, as Ryan said, I'm Angie Ward. I'm gonna introduce our panelists and we're gonna get our conversation underway. So um, we've got David, Dr. David Bushart. Um, David is professor of theology and historical studies here at Denver Seminary. He has a whole host, an alphabet soup of fantastic degrees. Uh, from a, a variety of institutions, um, is a member of the American Academy of Religion, Evangelical Theological Soci Society. Uh, I had the opportunity to take a class with him last fall, which is a real privilege. Um, he's been uh, a scholar in residence at the Institute for Ecumenical and Cultural Research at St. John's University, Collegeville, Minnesota. Uh, degrees include Wheaton, Trinity Divinity, uh, Drew University. Uh, just a privilege to have you here. David, good to have good you. Good to be here. Yeah. Uh, despite next we'll, everything you've said. Yes, exactly. <laughs> yes. This, this, despite all that, he's a great guy. <laughs> uh, and then we also have uh, Reverend Dr. Ambrose Carroll. Ambrose, welcome. Uh, Ambrose is a pastor of the Renewal Worship Christian Church in the Bay Area in Oakland and the founder of Green the Church, a national environmental organization for the Black Church worldwide. Uh, he's got degrees from Morehouse School of Religion in Atlanta and United Theological Seminary in Dayton and MBA from Golden Gate University in San Francisco. Ambrose, welcome. Good to have you here. Thank you. Great to be in the house. Okay. And then uh, last but certainly not least, Anthony Pieri. He, Anthony is a Denver Seminary alum, um, MA in Biblical and Theological Studies. Uh, he, he's coming to us from Chicago editor of um, the, an editor at the Pour Over, which is a uh, Christian newsletter um, reaching hundreds of thousands of subscribers. He also for a time led Dot Church Online, which is a fully online church community that helped 300 plus people process through deconstruction and move toward reconstruction. So Anthony, good to have you here. Glad well. to be here. Thanks yeah. so much. 
Good. Well, so let's start our conversation today. I think we need to start out by defining what we mean by this term of deconstruction. And so um, I'm going to introduce briefly what um, I think, what I learned from my understanding of it, and then ask you guys, um, you three, to, for if you, there's anything I'm off base or you would add, because there's a variety of ways I've seen or heard it used. And so um, historically, my understanding is it was a method of literary criticism, largely in the 1960s, the work of French philosopher Jacques Derrida, um, it then expanded to other areas to mean a complete, um, could mean a complete dismantling of tradition, even of truth. But when I hear it now, I, I often, I don't, most people that I hear don't necessarily use it in that term or to that extent. It's more of a critical examination of what we believe or what we've been taught to believe. And I've seen it about um, church and kind of practice of church, about evangelicalism, and then some do about religion God, faith, even truth, and obviously those all are related. Am I? What am I missing? How would you expand on what I've thrown out there? Am I off base? I'll start with you, David. Oh, I was going to say I want to hear from Anthony on that. Uh, okay. Would, would you start, Anthony? There you yes, go, Anthony. Ser seriously, I think uh, you've had a more focused, dedicated engagement with this than I know that I have. So I really be interested to hear Anthony's description. Great. Yeah, yeah for Anthony. sure. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. Uh, great to be on with all of you guys. Um, yeah, so I think deconstruction, I think you you hit the nail on the head. It is very broad. I don't think most people are using it in the the way that Derrida used it. Um, I think you're right that it is, it's, there's different spheres of it that sometimes it can be, I'm deconstructing my entire religious experience. Um, I don't know if I believe in God anymore, that kind of piece. It could be more just about your faith tradition. We've seen a lot of it around evangelicalism specifically. Um, and so it really depends who you ask, but it's essentially, it's, it's looking at everything that you've been taught over the years and saying, is this all true? Trying to go back and almost in a systematic way, uh, but it doesn't always happen like that, more organic, but basically looking over the course of everything you've learned and saying, is this actually true? Looking at it through a critical lens. And oftentimes that ends up with you dismantling or getting rid of some of the things that you had thought were true, uh, but no longer think are true. Yeah, great. Thanks, Anthony. Um, Ambrose, would you add anything? And then I'll go back to you and with you, David. Yeah, I think it's, um, I, I, it, you know, kind of like this pandemic era that we are in, I think we are, are in a new era. I think that the, you know, that the, nat that the natural tendency to explore what you believe, to rethink some things in general has always occurred. But I, but I do think we are at a different point of inflection. Like we are, there, there is questioning and conversations. I know as a kid of the 80s that we didn't uh, you know, really dare to kind of open up. There are things that are being spoken that we didn't think about, or if we thought about it, we wouldn't feel comfortable speaking about it. So I, it's definitely a fascinating time. Can you give an example of one of those things maybe that was taboo, but that now is more open for conversation? Oh, just, I mean, the inherency of scripture, right? Is everything in scripture yeah. true or not, right? Like, you know. Yeah, yeah, good. Right, thanks for that example. David, anything you want to add? Yeah, just uh, w without disagreeing with anything that's been said, I think some, for me, contextually, one is historical, mm -hmm. and that is that it seems to me that um, this application, that the phenomenon that's being described now as deconstruction uh, isn't new. Um, mm -hmm. if, if we think about how it's mm -hmm. just been described, um, there's nothing new about people deeply questioning. Uh, sometimes they refer to it as inherited beliefs or fundamental beliefs. And in some cases, questioning them to the point of departing from them. Uh, so just, I think there needs to be a recognition that's not, if you will, new. Um, and, and secondly, uh, along the lines of some of what Ambrose said, uh, just, I think we have to look at this contextually that our whole society at the moment is uh, unsettled in mm -hmm. turbulence. Uh, there's anger, there's people pushing back against whether it's mores or institutions or whatever that have been long standing. 
So when I look at the phenomenon of, for example, ex ex angelicals, mm -hmm. uh, ex evangelicals, ex angelicals, uh, um, I, I think one of the ways that has to be viewed is is contextually that this is a sub in some ways it's a distinctive subset of a of a larger more pervasive kind of cultural context at at the moment yeah that's yeah great insight i don't say to dismiss it but simply to to observe that yeah well yeah absolutely and and uh you know um contextual and and historically this is christianity today's you know we announced this topic and then Two days ago, I get uh, in my inbox Christianity Today's cover story for the next issue is this topic of deconstruction. Mm. And mm. so uh, clearly it is. And, and uh, some of you have listened to the Mar Rise and Fall of Mars Hill podcast. There was some conversation mm. about that, too. And how much of it is um, experience is cultural? How much is, you know, where where is the truth, the goodness, the beauty and that process of questioning? Uh, let me, let's talk about a little bit. What is the um, uh, what is the experience of deconstruction? We've talked a little bit about kind of the definition and the process of it. I mean, it's this questioning and holding maybe loosely and maybe sometimes is it getting rid of some things or re, you know, deciding what to keep. What is that? What's the experience of that? What does that feel like? What have you seen, experienced, observed? Who wants to take a stab? Ever, I'm going to start with you on this one. Oh, great! Yeah, so uh, sure, I was uh, a passionate church here in the Bay Area, and I and I don't think uh, you know my immediate community really you know struggles with with the words of what we're talking about. Like I don't think anybody said you know we're reconstructing our faith, but I think that there are some things. Um, I sometimes I think of myself as being young, but I come from a very, you know, stoic kind of tradition. And I remember starting a service for young people when I first got to the church and the young people wanted to do the service, even to the degree that I think that they were offended by the fact that I was structuring worship and they just wanted me to sit down so they could do what then they would call worship, right? kind of outside of the clergy, a clergy being a part of it in and of itself was against the grain of what was wanted. It was as if I was defying some new ethic, right? Um, and so I, I think for me, that's been a part of the experience um, as we are, you know, doing church, you know, perhaps the way um, our elders did it or even you know, what it means to be the pastor or a quote unquote spiritual leader. Um, is that still a thing or, you know, when and why that becomes offensive to others? So that's how it's um, kind of played out for me. Yeah, great, thanks. David, anything for, that, you, that you've observed or as you've well, had conversations? Yeah, well, if if I heard your question correctly, I this is not a brag, it's just a report. I, I can't claim to have experienced deconstruction. Um, I did walk alongside my wife during a season that at the time, it, that word wasn't being used that way, but mm -hmm. it, it definitely would today be called deconstruction. And as I anticipated this, I just tried to reflect and yeah. I'll just read, uh, just I jotted single, a, a list of characteristics in my mind, mm. uh, pain, anger, confusion, disappointment, disillusionment, despair. Uh, and I'm not claiming that everybody who would self-describe as deconstructing would experience all of those. But from my, if you will, outside observer perspective, those are some of the, if you will, emotions or experiences that it looks to me like uh, people are experiencing. Yeah, that's so great because um, I love that you have that unique perspective of walking with someone, even if you haven't quite, you know, um, lived through that. You're, I mean, so you are living through it just in a, a different way. As someone close to you is doing that, what is that like for you? Can, would you be willing to share a bit about how that was for you in that? Um, well, whatever I say may sound self-serving. <laughs> I don't want to do that. But I, I, I actually, in anticipation this morning, you know, Nancy and I had a conversation about this, recalling mm -hmm. this period, which now is a couple of decades ago. 
But the fact is that I, I made the observation to her that, you know, a, a webinar isn't going to be necessarily the place where somebody who is in the midst of this, you know, uh, is going to necessarily find all that they need, right? And, and that right. this is intensely personal. Mm -hmm. and, and so that it involves having people walk alongside of you. And uh, she recalled a, a moment where both her best friend and I were sitting on the couch next to her. And she said, my God has died. Mm. And, and we both just, we, we said, we will, we will be here with you as you walk through this and not knowing how long, not in a hurry and not knowing what the, what the, what the outcome would be. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. So we just assured her of our companionship in, as she walked through it. Yeah, I, you know, I think um, having walked through myself and with some others, I think some of the, you know, you said some of the emotions, I would add, you know, there's an unsettled or maybe even a fearful for, you know, what does this, what does this um, mean for my whole belief system? What does this mean for my relationships? You know, will these people still love me, still walk with me, you know, and, mm. and to point like you know, what Nancy said, she's, she said, um, my God is dead, not not like god is dead but my yes. what my understanding it it was and it's an earth-shaking thing yeah, yeah this was intensely personal for her right yeah. and she didn't say to me she didn't say to me god is dead yeah she she owned it if i can put it this way and said my god is dead yeah um, my understanding yeah anthony you know i will go to over to you same question you with walking with so many who have uh, been experiencing this what would you uh, add or some unique take on that what is the experience like for those you yeah with? I, so i would completely agree with everything everything that david and ambrose um said about how it feels to go through deconstruction there's one other angle though that makes it even harder mm. is that um people there's sort of a perception that people who are deconstructing you see lots of articles written by mm -hmm. you know pastors and, and thought leaders who kind of describe people de deconstructing as they're just kind of nonchalantly walking away from this. I don't want to do this. I want to have a more liberal sexual ethic or whatever it is and just leaving. And people will make the argument, well, they were never really Christians anyways. They didn't really try. But those people who actually are leaving churches for that reason are not the people who would be in the camp of deconstructing. The ones who would use the phrase deconstructing are the ones who were deeply invested in the church, mm -hmm. uh, deeply trying to do all the things that we say you should do as a, as a Christian. And for whatever reason, they're being uh, sort of pushed out or, or changing their beliefs. And, and in that place of despair where they don't know where to turn, they're also feeling the added stress of seeing so many high level Christian leaders kind of bashing them. And the, and the, the problem is because a lot of the leaders will see some more vocal, angry deconstruction thought leaders who are out there putting out a lot of kind of vitriolic content. And so they, they take those figures and ascribe it to all the people in the actual experience. When the bulk of the people that I was directly involved with, people deeply invested in the church and, and really saying, I don't know what to do. I feel like I have to leave, but it's going to destroy all these different relationships. And then also having that added stress of kind of being hit over the head as they're on the way out. Mm. Uh, so, so it's just a very, very hard space to be in. And these people mm. were in deep, deep despair from, from both angles of it. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Yeah. I've, I've seen it as kind of a, um, a fear of a deep sense of homelessness. Where, 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 where am I safe? Where am I at home? Who, who are my people? It's not just a cognitive thing. In other words, it's, yeah. it's a, a whole holistic experience. Yeah. Well, so we've, you know, let, let's talk a little bit. I mean, we talked about there, there seems to be a rise in this, or, or this is the, the term at least, maybe we would just use the terminology. It's David talked about, you know, there's this, it's necessarily not, not new, but there is to be, you know, our whole world in this COVID world, there's an unsettling. Um, so should the church be concerned? Is this, is this a, is deconstruction good? Is it bad? Is it neutral? Is it a natural thing? I'm going to start with you, Dave. Um, I, I don't want to, if I, I wouldn't call it natural in that I, I think, in other words, I don't think we should either regard it as aberrant 
nor should we regard it as normative. Okay. It's, it's neither. Um, God works in mysterious ways with the wide array of human beings. Um, and I, I know numbers of people who, who will say, for example, I have a rather boring Christian story. I accepted Christ early on. I've, I've appreciated and tried to learn from the scriptures all my life, and I've never had a fundamental kind of, if you will, serious doubting of the basics of my faith. I don't think that that should either be dismissed as unhealthy or held up as this is the way it ought to be. Sure. It, that is one way. And there are other people who will uh, may pass through, not knowing where it ends up, um, a period of serious and grave doubt, disorientation, um, questioning, troubling, and that happens. And when it does, um, the Christian community ought to surround them with, uh, you know, with both grace and truth, with love and, and care. Um, you know, when the, the, the episode, and I won't labor it, but just say the, the circumstances that led to, to Nancy's um, uh, journey some decades ago, they were equally for they were equally episodes in my life. These were things that happened to the two of us together. Okay. Our responses to it were very different because we are very different people. Uh, we're different people. We have different histories, to some extent, different theology. And so our passage through that season was quite different. Okay. Um, so I, I don't want to either label it as aberrant and we should try to stamp it out, nor would I want to make it normative. Hmm. Yeah, great insight. Anthony and Ambrose, uh, or Ambrose, anything you want to add? Should the church be concerned about this? What's what's your thoughts? Yeah, I think the word, uh, you know, concerned, um, I think, you know, is, is the issue of, I think, how we hold power. I was having a conversation once, and our community, again, you know, may not use the word deconstruction, but a word that I have heard used is decolonization, mm. right? The de decolonization mm. of the church. So we talk about, um, you know, bringing in, you know, questions, having conversations about spirituality, uh, about Christianity before the West. And I raised a question once. I said, you know, some of these things I'm fine talking about in the academic setting, but I don't know if I open it up in my local parish, I don't know if I'll be able to close it. And, uh, yes. And mm. someone mm. challenged me and said, mm. well, well, that's probably part of the problem. Is it really your role and responsibility to close it? Mm. Right. Yeah. Again, I come from mm. a place that has been constructed, right? That this is how it goes. This is how we keep community safe. This is how it rides. And if it does something other than that, then we may lose those controls. And the question is, maybe that's okay. Right. Mm -hmm. And so um, it, I think we are in a very interesting um, place um, where we look at at the church, the community uh, and what is at its essence. Right. What what, what are the ethics that we really want to hold? I was talking with the Korean sister the other day who said she's actually left the church. She said, I don't believe in Jesus. And then she said, but my dad died of last year. And she said, that community, my mother has not cooked in over a year because when my dad died, the faith community stepped mm -hmm. in in such a way that was so intimate, that was so loving, right? How do you leave <laughs> that kind of community, right? Mm -hmm. Even, right, when you have different mm -hmm. beliefs, right? Even when you are heretic. And so I, 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 I think it is, you know, I think mm -hmm. as long as we continue to draw circles that that hold us together, I think I think I, mm -hmm. I think I would be concerned in the breakdown of that of those communities. Great! Wow, mm -hmm. thank you for that perspective, mm -hmm. Anthony. Anything you want to? Any other insights you want to add? Yeah, I think um, church, a lot of churches and pastors um, 
concerned, right? Like they, I think it would be helpful for a lot of pastors if they're not already to actually try to speak to some of the people who are deconstructing rather than just reading about them in articles or seeing or making broad stroke right yeah yeah yeah. because a lot of times like i said earlier the people leaving it's not like the uh, if you take the story of the prodigal son the the younger brother who leaves because he wants to pursue licentiousness and, and go all over the world the people leaving because of they're in this deconstruction phase they're not the younger brother type it's people leaving who really get the church who understand it and are pointing out very real flaws like i saw that we're going to be there's another panel coming up on the sexual abuse in the church, right? So, so concerned in the sense that they should be taking these things seriously if some of their most longtime faithful people are leaving the church because they're seeing these issues that are unresolvable. That should raise a lot of red flags that we need to actually take this seriously and look at what these concerns are and what's causing all these people to be leaving in droves, especially the younger generation. Mm-hmm. Yeah, wow. Um. Well, so we've talked a little bit about already uh, touched on some themes about how do you walk with someone in a period of deconstruction? You know, you've given your some great examples uh, about what is helpful or not helpful. Some of the things I'm hearing is about understanding it's unique to everyone um, and, and that our, you know, we all have a constructed, you know, Ambrose, you said we all have, we all live in a constructed, uh, you know, belief system and world and culture plays a piece in that, our history, all those pieces. And so, so recognizing that just being available, saying we love you no matter what. Um, you said talking about the circle of community and keeping those connections. Are there other things that you would add, you know, and, and Anthony said, we'll talk to these people, you know, and, and not just make assumptions or broad generalizations. What other things are helpful or absolutely unhelpful to, for us to, how do we embody the, the truth and spirit of Jesus in these spaces and conversations? Anthony, I'll start with you this time. Yeah, I think um, a lot of pastors and church leaders um, who do it really well um, aren't really afraid to, to give a broader perspective than maybe their theological tradition. So I, I always felt that Denver, when I was in my time at the school getting my degree, uh, I felt that they, the professors modeled this really well, that a lot of times people will be leaving a specific tradition because they think this is the only way that uh, Christianity can be true. It has to look like literal 6,000 year old Genesis one is exactly how it happened. And if I don't believe that I might as well leave Jesus behind. And so I think when people are walking through deconstruction, if you are someone who knows that there are broader theological perspectives, especially when you consider Christianity on a global scale, that it can be helpful in those moments to say, listen, our tradition believes this, but there are other sister and brother traditions that are slightly different so that it's not actually you choose my specific denomination or my specific church doctrine, or else you have to leave Christianity altogether. Letting people know that Christianity is a little bit more global, that there are faithful traditions going all the way back to the time of Jesus that have disagreed on these things and kind of letting people know that this isn't a black and white in or out tribalism style culture, that Christianity is much of a broader umbrella with different traditions that have interpreted these things different ways. And that can go a really long way for someone who's really struggling with some specific issues that they think means they have to leave Christianity altogether, just giving them that broader perspective. Yeah. For me, it was so helpful just to realize there that others the the, um the christianity you know i don't know that that that, um space there's multiple streams within that and and many many of them they're very life-giving streams and so i only lived along one stream for most of my life and then i went oh and so i thought to go to another stream was to like to leave my stream was to go outside of the country and they're like no it's a big country there's a lot of streams there Ambrose, anything you want to uh, add? And then I'll go over to David. Yeah, I've got a, a poem in my head. Uh, yeah. it's, he drew a circle to shut me out, a heretic, a rebel, a thing to flout, the love and I had the wit to win. And we drew a circle to draw him in. Wait, I can think- you say that again slower? <laughs> I, that, yeah, I want to catch that again for our listeners too. Yeah. He, he drew a circle uh, to shut me out, a heretic, a rebel, a thing to flout. But love and I had the wit to win, and we drew a circle that took him in. It's wow. by Ed Markey. Wow. Edwin Markey. Um, you know, the reality of, you know, of, of, of how individuals, you know, their own lived experience 
uh, moving through, you know, having different concepts about God. The sun, Sunday school lesson this week centers around Job, right? And it centers around one who's moving through this whole, I would call it a period of DD construction. Everything that is believed about God, uh, about um, God's, uh, about how God's love works, about how you live in a place where you have everything that you need, uh, where you don't experience a lot of trials and temptations. And even Satan in the text said, who wouldn't serve a God like that? But let some rain fall into your life. And then you have to reconsider uh, what your relationship with what is divine is really all about. And so I think it is a great opportunity uh, you know, for individuals to actually lead and walk with people uh, through an important place in life. I heard someone say that pandemics are like uh, portals to brand new worlds. And I think that with this many people actually doing the work, right, of, of, of theologizing is really a powerful time in history, right? Mm. Right, wrong, or indifferent. People on their knees, talking to God, talking to one another, asking unaskable questions, right? I, I, I mean, I asked some questions in college and my uh, theology professor looked at me and said, uh, you're not supposed to ask those kind of questions. Mm -hmm. Uh, not really helpful, <laughs> right? Yeah. So, right. But I, I think this is where we are, and it's a place that all of us will have to walk in a different level of faith and faithfulness. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Lord. David, any other additional thoughts, uh, suggestions? Yeah. Well, two notes. One, uh, I don't think Anthony intended it this way, but I'll just say I feel like Anthony gave a great what shall I say, uh, advertisement for the value of studying the history of Christianity. Mm. Uh, if, you, if you just study yes. the history of Christianity, you will arrive after very long and realize, oh my goodness, this is a far more diverse and varied landscape than I ever knew, right? And, and you're actually getting a window into the way Christianity not just has been thought about, but the way it's actually been lived out in communities and individual lives. Um, so just a, a, a plug, if I can put it that way, for uh, the study of the history of Christianity. The second observation I wanted to make, and I'm, I'm particularly struck by Ambrose's uh, comments, at, which I, I very much appreciate and understand when he talked about, and Ambrose, correct me if I misheard you, but you know that I, I recognize the need and want to engage hard questions in my church I also have to think about what happens if we open this thing up and, mm -hmm. and I, I, I'm responsible to kind of bring some resolution. So let me here just highlight what, at least from where I sit, as one of the ways that church and the academy can complement each other is mm -hmm. that I, I think that on the one hand, churches need to be, you know, wrestle with tough issues, be willing to let people ask tough questions, et cetera. But I also respect, at least in my own view of the church, this is the place where people are to have kind of a, 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 a point of stability and a reference point and a frame of reference for engaging the world, for engaging the larger landscape of Christianity. So I think it's good to have very distinct Christian communities. Having said that, um, that's one of the ways where I think the seminary can complement and serve the church, because when I stand up in a class, I, I don't have the responsibility of a pastor, and I want to be very clear, that doesn't mean I don't care for my students, but it means part of my role is to, I have my own views, I happen to be a Presbyterian elder, uh, but my role is to talk about Pentecostalism and the Wesley and Arminian tradition and, you know, the Anabaptist tradition. And in my case, I'm teaching now on Orthodoxy and Roman Catholicism. And uh, part of it, it goes far beyond what I personally think. And on Sunday, I'll go to my Presbyterian church with great thanks. Um, but my students have an opportunity in our context where it is education to help them 
kind of be open, have their eyes open to a larger landscape. And again, in a constructive way, not in a, not in an intentionally deconstructive way, but in a constructive way of saying, we want to put before you a rich, diverse kind of sampling or window into the Christian faith, not to remove you from your community, but to help enrich you mm. and, and your community. That's great. Yeah. That's, a, that, that's a, a great plug, but it's just tr true in my lived experience as well. And I, and, you know, those of you, I saw you guys nodding for that. Um, so yeah, thank you for that perspective. Um, I see that there's a lot of great questions coming in from listeners. And so I'm going to throw it over to Ryan. And uh, if you can facilitate some of these or throw out some of these questions here, we'd love to go through some of those. Absolutely. We are having a lot of wonderful questions come in. Um, the one that we want to ask first is, are there common beliefs, systems, and or structures that maybe contribute to the dissonance between faith and experience that lead people to deconstruction? I'll repeat that one more time. Please. Are there common beliefs, systems, and or structures that contribute to the dissonance between faith and experience that may lead to deconstruction? Well, that's a good question. I'll let, I'll let you all answer it. Yeah, I was going to say, anyone who wants to, to jump in on that, I, I've seen there's a, uh, when there's a disconnect between what we've been taught and then what we've experienced. And so I've had an experience where I was in an institution where they very much claimed a per, their particular doctrine was the truth and there was no nuance or alternative to it. And, it, and um, uh, on some what some would say historically say have been more secondary issues. And at the same time, I did not see the spirit of Jesus or the ways of Jesus among those people. And that way we go, well, if they're telling me this, is, what else are they telling me that's maybe not, you know, it, there was that dissonance between that. Uh, but I don't know, if, do you have, you guys have anything you wanna, uh, from your experience or observation, are there certain streams, experiences? Ambrose, it looks like you wanna dive in there, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I, 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 I mean, I think, yeah, I mean, people, and, 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 and like was stated by David earlier, none, none of these things are new. You know, when people grow, go away, they see things differently, they have different experiences, so, okay, this doesn't really jive, um, but we're in such a new place, and, and even as, you know, as custodian, right, of the faith, where there should be, you use the word, that place of the ability, right, that we really can come and understand who we are in this place. The problem is when I was in seminary back in 94, 95, whatever I learned in, sem in seminary down in Atlanta, whatever we were talking about and discussing about the Bible, uh, about philosophy, history, when I came back, like there was no one in my community talking about those things, right? Hmm. But now we have this thing called the internet and Google, mm -hmm. and there are people who are now opening up to some of these biblical criticisms and all kinds of criticisms, and they're going down the road without, you know, again, we had the professors to help lead us through, to help mm -hmm. show us how to think about mm -hmm. it, move it, but now there's just a free, you know, it's kind of like the opening of the seventh seal or something right like all the books have been open right <laughs> everything's open and people are you know and a little little uh knowledge is a can be a dangerous thing right yeah. so we live in a world where we are following um individuals and trying to play catch up with what they may be thinking getting and gathering from other mm. voices mm. you know what i hear you saying we don't have the same system of guides that we had uh and maybe certain, you know, and like you said, to kind of process and, and yes. filter that. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, little knowledge is a dangerous thing. Mm -hmm. uh, Anthony, anything to add to that? Or I think I would just sort of say the same thing that you did, Angie. Um, I think we, a lot of us discount the, uh, when Jesus talks about, you'll, you'll know a tree by its fruit, that a lot of us think that we can take theology and just have it like as this pure thing. And if you have that right theology, that's what matters. Mm -hmm. But if that theology, if people who hold a certain brand of theology, if they're live the way they actually enact it is a way that is not reflective of the fruit of the spirit, that people can very quickly see the incongruence and, mm -hmm. and that can 
sort of cast doubt on the whole enterprise. Well, if you follow that Jesus guy and you say you believe all these things, why are you treating all these people this way? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. good, thanks. Ryan, uh, another question from listeners. Here she comes. Absolutely. So, sorry, we have a kind of a wide variety of questions that are coming in. I bet. Let me find us a good one to address. <laughs> Could you maybe offer some questions that somebody who is walking along someone who is deconstructing would maybe ask them um, in their conversation and really how do they invest in that relationship? Great, great question. Uh, David, I want to start with you because you've uh, walked through this personally. You had some insights already. Uh, what, you know, yeah. what are some good questions to ask? That, that's a good question <laughs> itself. And, and I, I, I confess, um, at the moment, I'm caught a little off guard. I, I will say this. Um, I do think the first step is to listen. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, I'm talking a lot here, right? And it may seem ironic, but when students will ask me, so what, what are the skills a, a good theologian should have? They're sometimes surprised that I actually say to them, well, the first thing you need to do is to listen. And you need to listen to God, listen to and for God through the scriptures and elsewhere. And then depending on who you're interacting with, you need to listen to them. So um, without necessarily at the moment being able to articulate a specific question, I, I mean, so obviously one question is just, what what has led you to these sure. beliefs? What has led you to this doubt, right? Um, and and to then try to hear and understand what has led up to this point. Yeah, I think you've touched on something. Just in the the, the there's a posture to the questions too, not just mm-hmm. uh, so you mm-hmm. can say you know well what's led you to this as kind of an inquisition versus a curiosity and a truly you know. Uh, open-handed, you know, another one I've heard is just kind of, um, I guess it's a statement, but it's really, tell me more, you know, mm-hmm. and, and, and uh, mm-hmm. so there's not a loaded answer behind the question. It's just yeah. really seeking to understand as you're Seeking as you're to understand, and for some people, if you don't agree with them, they may, they may act as though, well, you don't understand, um, and that, I, I don't know how to quite get past that, but at, but there does need to be a deep, I think, a deep commitment to really trying to hear and understand. Yeah. Uh, as yeah. as a first, kind of as a first step. Yeah. Yeah. Ambrose. Yeah. Yeah, I think I I say you. like this. I I think that love would not attempt to rescue them from the process. Mm. Um, mm. You know, sometimes we become mm. argumentative because. We want them to see things differently, or we don't necessarily want them to go down that road. But I think that love allows people to move through their process, even if people are going to hit the ground, right? Mm-hmm. Maybe by hitting the ground, they become grounded. Um, and even having faith in God, mm-hmm. right? And, and then that we don't uh, pick up a God complex, right? Mm-hmm. It, because at the end of the day, uh, God, uh, as God did with Job, can handle people's despair can handle people's questions and so walk with them um, and allow them to move through that process and if you are triggered because oftentimes people give pushback not because someone else is going through but because it begins to trigger something in you right (laughs) and if it takes you down a path uh then again um you know as believers as individuals who have had spiritual encounters right we've been born again right, that we have to trust God uh, in our process. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, you said talking about being triggered, I think one of the questions or a set of questions is to be present to what's happening in us, too, and going, what is this bringing up for me, and why, what is, you know, what am I feeling, and why might I be feeling that in response? Am I feeling the need to, to play God, to orchestrate, to rescue, to answer, to solve, um, or yeah, what are those things? And I think that might be another set of 
questions that is a parallel set of questions. Anthony, anything you'd like to add there? Uh, Am Ambrose, you took, you took the, uh, what I was going to say right at the end, that was perfect. Uh, I was going to say so many of the times it reveals the fear in our own hearts when we start asking questions because it starts bubbling up things in ourselves. So completely agree with that. I think you had questions not to ask, uh, dismissive <laughs> questions like, are you just doing this? Because, you know, you've been following too many people on Twitter who are, you know, <laughs> All that kind of stuff. So, uh, yeah, the posture is a huge piece of, of trying to do it in a, from a place of love and just trying to understand where someone's at. And I mean, uh, I'm not a five point Calvinist myself, but the idea that God is sovereign, right? And it's not on us to preserve this person's salvation in this moment. Uh, and that God can be working in someone's life over the long haul. So, not to see every time someone's deconstructing as a this is a threat to their eternal security. So, mm -hmm. have, have some more faith in God. Yeah. Yeah, I think trusting the Holy Spirit's process in their life, you know, and you said, Ambrose, sometimes they have to, um, by hitting the ground, they become grounded. I thought that was a great, great image. You know, I have a friend who says, let Jesus do the Jesus thing. <laughs> you know, we don't, we don't, we don't have to take that, that burden on ourselves. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is, yeah, great tip. I think we have one closing question that Ryan's got prepared for us. Ryan, I'm going to send it over to you. It's been so good. I just feel like we could talk for another hour, but alas, Ryan, what's we have last enough question? questions for another hour. Oh, certainly, I bet. Yeah. It's made our job wonderful to sort through all these. So thank you all for your active participation. Um, our closing kind of question today is adjacent to the one we just asked. Um, and it is assuming that there is a healthy way to deconstruct one's faith or beliefs, what might be some best practices for deconstruction, both for those who are themselves deconstructing and for those who walk alongside them? And of course, if you all have any resources that you could offer, that would be greatly helpful. I'll repeat that one more time. Assuming yep. there is a healthy way to deconstruct one's faith or beliefs, what might be some best practices for deconstruction? both for those who are themselves deconstructing and for those that walk alongside them. So that's great. And I think we've, we've just kind of talked about um, some of the walking alongside. So let's focus a bit more on, to the start at least, on the, the best, or I think another word she brought up there in kind of healthy practices for, for deconstructing. Uh, Anthony, you wanna start with this one? Yeah, um, I think I, I, would, I would almost push back on the assumption of the question, just that, hmm deconstructing is from my experience of, of the people that I've talked with and walked with it's not necessarily something someone is choosing to do it especially in that person it feels like something that is happening to you mm -hmm. so uh, I, I wouldn't consider it. most of these people are not sitting down saying hey I'm going to blow up my entire religious upbringing and I'm going to blow up my community and just completely destroy all my closest relationships for fun or something uh, so I think a lot of people there it's happening to them and so we can, on the outside, do our best to try to help keep them grounded, give them safe spaces to wrestle through these things. But for the people themselves, I'm not sure that it, they're even seeing it as a way of like, okay, I need to make sure I follow these best practices sure. or, or do this or that. David or Ambrose, I'd be curious to see if you would agree or, or disagree. I, I think you raise a, a good dimension of this, which is um, I still believe that the individual person has a great deal of power here, right? So it, it's, it's not as though people can come around and somehow fix it. Um, we can try to create a setting and a context and, and re provide resources that, you know, but, but there is a sense in which it's going it, 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 to, it, uh, it's going to fall back to the person. And, and as you said, Anthony, you know, in God's providence and the work of the Holy Spirit, um, and I, I'm not being fatalist here, and I'm not kind of washing hands of responsibility, but I think we have to have a deep respect for um, the significance of the person and the work of the Spirit. Um, so as I was talking about this with my wife, you know, she made reference to prayer. Um, prayer both by the person who's experiencing this uh, without prescribing what that prayer ought to be like uh, and prayer on the part of the person or persons who are accompanying them uh, that we should never presume that this can somehow be engaged without 
the the work of the Holy Spirit in people's minds and minds and hearts. Mm -hmm. Ambrose, I'll go to you in a, in a moment. I just say, you know, Anthony, my experience is that um, times in my own life and others I've seen, like you said, there's there's a sense of you've been upended, and it's and I think of when a big wave crashes over you in the ocean and and you're just sputtering to catch your breath. And so there's not even enough, you're, you're just surviving at that point. There's, yeah. there's some time where it's just, a, a, it feels like a big mess. And so I think over time you start to take apart the threads and, and, and that's the process of kind of more, if, if, once you kind of catch your breath and sputter to the surface, then you go, okay, wait, what, what happened here? You know, or what's going on? You can take apart those things. But in the moment at first, at least, it's just mm. disequilibrium of the highest you know, extent, and you're just going, uh, uh, who's here? What's going on? You know, kind of thing. And so then I think you go, okay, well, how am I going to untangle these things? Or instead of, and, and, uh, and that takes time and just the time of the Holy Spirit and the working through that has been my experience. Ambrose, what would you, wisdom would you like to add? Yeah. I mean, I think what, what I've heard is, is, is definitely true that it's, it's, you know, that it's not necessarily an academic rigor. Uh, that you need it is it is spiritual growth and development which what I believe church is all about I gave my life to Christ I was eight years old at the first Baptist church in St. Louis Missouri I was baptized my mom gave me a big white bible I still have it um, but I got to a point in my life in ministry after being in ministry for over 30 years after being a practical theologian uh, where I myself leading people I was looking at the word. I'm telling his friends, man, I think I'm through. I'm done. Like, this is not adding up. Uh, when you talk about deconstruction or decolonization, how did we get here? What's the history of movement? Uh, how the Bible was written. And I have a good friend uh, who'd been in the work and had been through his own process of deconstruction. He said, Ambrose, don't throw that Bible away. He said, Ambrose, that there are, there are spiritual truths, that they're ancient even scientific notions within it that are true, that carry us at the rudiment. He said, what's happening is that you are not declining. What's happening is that you are growing. Yeah. So I think uh, that it's happening and it, and it does happen to you, right? But I think it is about being prayerful. It is about the practices that we're given as Christians to read, to study, to pray, to meditate would be my, I wouldn't call it an antidote, would be my balm. Um, yeah. hmm. Balm's a good word. Yeah, hmm. good word. Angie, yeah. to your to your point earlier too, just about kind of getting your head, um, like, you know, you're, you're trying to just tread water. And then eventually, if you kind of reach that equilibrium, I think that mm -hmm. is sort of like the distinction between being in deconstruction and maybe moving into a reconstruction. Yeah. Uh, and so like when, when I was leading that community online called Dot Church, um, that was basically, we positioned ourselves as kind of like a halfway house between no church and church. So people could come in and kind of try to reconstruct their beliefs. So we'd help mm. them when they were sputtering and, and trying to keep their head above water. And then when things settled down a little and they said, okay, well, what should I do? I don't want to leave Jesus. I've gotten to the place where I know that I want to keep following Jesus, but I don't know if I can go back to this tradition. And then I think that's where kind of best practices come into place. Like actually look around, see what what are other denominations believe. Look outside of what may be the narrow tradition you were you were born into, and see what else other Christians have believed over the centuries. You know, in the and uh, millennia, if if you want to go that far back. Yeah, that's great. We uh, I am aware of the time here, and like I said, we could talk for a long time. I just thank you uh, each of you for this. Um, uh, just quickly. Um, if people who are listening want to follow what you're doing or, or some things you're working on, what tell us what you're what you're doing or where they can find you. Anthony, I'll start with you. Yeah, so um, like you mentioned at the beginning, I write for uh, the Pour Over. It's an online Christian newsletter. It has three per week, um, and it's, it tries to provide the news and some Christian reflection without being partisan. Huh. So um, I just encourage anyone to subscribe. It's it's a really great resource. I think um, the pourover.org is the website. It's free. So that's probably the best, best place. Great. David, how about you? Take a class um, with you. I can recommend that. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that's very good of you. Um, I'll, I'll just say if there are people out and uh, if there are people out here listening uh, who want to contact, uh, it's really my Denver Seminary email address, david.com. 
bushhart at denverseminary.edu. Um, as, uh, as far as what I'm working on currently, I'm, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm working on an essay that, that reflects on the connections between two things that some people think don't have any connection, which is academic and scholarly work and personal spiritual formation hmm. and, and how those um, uh, there's cross there's cross training that takes place. Great, cool. Ambrose, how about you? Uh, uh, you can uh, uh, check us out on www.greenthechurch.org, greenthechurch.org, uh, a national organization uh, that really chronicles what the African American church is doing in the environmental uh, and sustainability spaces throughout the country, uh, caring for God's uh, environment and, and things of that nature. I uh, would love to have you uh, be a part, check out some of our information. Again, uh, Ambrose at greenthechurch.org or check us out on the web. Great, thank you. And I'm at uh, angiewardphd.com. That's kind of the link to all the other stuff that I'm doing. Also here at Denver Seminary um, with the Doctor of Ministry program. So uh, I wanna thank each of you three panelists. So great, this wonderful conversation. I, uh, those of you who are listening, I hope and pray it's been um, enlightening, perhaps uh, hope giving, uh, maybe healing, uh, encouraging conversations. Um, we, I, I think I speak for all of us, we hope and pray you will uh, continue to find Jesus faithful in wherever you're at in your uh, journey and stage of faith, um, deconstruction or walking with others uh, and pondering this entire topic. Um, we are going to end here in just a moment, uh, but uh, if you, the recording will be made available usually within 24 hours. You'll, if you've signed up for this, you've gotten this link, you will also get that uh, email and uh, can open that and watch that for the future. So thanks again to all of you who are watching, uh, joining online and to our participants. Peace to you. Peace. Peace and blessings. <laughs>